Good morning, Wabash. Today speaking at Pioneer Chapel is Maddox Lee, Andrew Young, Michael Walker, and Kenny Coleman with their talk entitled, America Through a Colored Lens. Maddox Lee is currently a junior from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and pursuing a chemistry major with an education minor. He is a member of both the wrestling and track teams. He is also the archival chairs of the Malcolm X Institute's Black Study. Mike has a creative writing and Spanish double major here at Wabash. He is from Indianapolis, Indiana, and enjoys writing, listening to music, and watching Marvel movies. A fun fact, he's been abroad twice, to Ecuador for a summer and to Spain for half a semester. Kenny Coleman is a rhetoric major and a minor in black studies. He is a member of the football and track and field teams, as well as being the chairman of the Malcolm X Institute of Black Studies. Kenny is a native of Muncie, Indiana, where he attended Muncie Central High School. And a fun fact about Kenny is he has six brothers and two sisters. Kenny enjoys cutting hair, listening to gospel music, and hanging with his roommates at Williams 124. Andrew Young is a senior here at Wabash. He has served as the, as the associate or associateship chair and co-chair at Malcolm X Institute of Black Studies. Andrew is a three-year letter winner in track and field, earning all conference and all region in the four by 400 meter relay. Young is a religion major and philosophy minor. He is unsure of his career path, but he wants to be a leader in his community, inspire young people to get into politics. He believes that the world needs to change now and we must fight for the morals created when our country was founded. Without further ado, please welcome our first speaker, Andrew Young. Good morning, Wabash. Before I continue to talk to you all about American hypocrisy, I must say this. When I refer to America, I am referring to white America and how she has discriminated and excluded us black people from society and full citizenship. I do not mean to offend anyone in the audience, although I'm sure some of you will find a reason to be offended by my words. America. America is a place of broken promises, a place of hypocrisy. The foundation of this country was founded on a promise that not all of its inhabitants were able to see fulfilled. America is a land of white privilege and hypocrisy, and it is this hypocrisy that I want to talk to you all about. In order to get a glimpse of how America looks through the lens of black people in America, it is important to highlight just a portion of the many hypocritical views, practices, and beliefs that America holds. As I mentioned earlier, the Founding Fathers wrote in the, in the Declaration of Independence that, and I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I bring this statement up to illustrate to you all just how flawed the foundation of America is, just how hypocritical America truly is. The Founding Fathers had the audacity, the gall, to make such claims while they themselves were doing the same thing they accused the British government of doing. The Founding Fathers were denying an entire group of people the very rights that they so proudly claimed to be unalienable to all men. The Declaration of Independence The Declaration of Independence also states that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government. If this is true, then why is it that Americans today call movements such as the Black Lives Matter anti-American. We are labeled as traitors, but those so-called patriots do not realize that we are just doing what is mentioned in the quote above and what the Founding Fathers did to Great Britain. While the Founding Fathers were fussing and complaining about paying taxes for a war that the British fought to protect them, 
Not to mention, they weren't even paying as much taxes as the citizens in Great Britain. Yet, when we as black people simply make a claim that our lives matter, when we protest the unlawful treatment and killings of black people by police, we're met with hatred, counter protest and called anti-American. But how can we be anti-American when we are just practicing a principle in which this great nation was founded on? The truth is this, as much as America tries to portray itself as the leader of the free world, a protector of democracy, and a country who comes together to embrace and protect its citizens, it's simply not true. This version of America is an illusion, a facade that claims, a facade that is created so that America can hide the truth from her citizens. America claims to be at war with terror, and they are doing everything in their power to protect the innocent from terrorists. So why then has America killed thousands of innocent men, women, and children with drone strikes they claim are necessary to stop the terrorist attacks and targets that they have on their list? America claims that blacks are criminals, bloodthirsty super predators who want to ruin your communities and destroy your households. But what America leaves out is that Richard Nixon and his war on crime was just a ploy to criminalize black power movements such as the Black Panthers and to lock up brown and black bodies. Ronald Reagan would continue this treatment with the war on drugs and it, and it is his administration that would pump crack cocaine into poor black neighborhoods. With this, by doing this, he was putting black people in jail jail and tearing apart families and neighborhoods. Today we see something similar with marijuana in America, where many black people are in jail because of bogus marijuana possessions. Not to mention white people in America were legally able to kill us through methods like lynching just until recently. The stand your ground law has been used as a defense for countless shootings of unarmed black men, such as Trayvon Martin. America claims to be the protector of democracy in the world, yet America has interfered with countless Latin American countries' governments and even putting governments that did not have the backing of the people just because the leader they were putting in charge was willing to be loyal to America and not loyal to his citizens of his nation. So why expose America for, the, for her hypocrisy? Simple so people can get a view on how America looks to black people. In the wake of the ruling of Breonna Taylor's case, many of my peers were shocked, surprised, and disappointed, but I was not. Being aware of America's hypocrisy and aware of the trend that has been set for people of color, you begin to see that this hypocrisy extends to justice. How can we, as a community, as a people, expect justice from a country that's scared of its own reflection? How can we expect justice from a country whose foundation is built on its ability to oppress black people? If we were aware of America's hypocrisy, then we would understand that it applies to the idea of justice as well. Rodney King, Latasha Harlins, Trayvon Martin, the list of black people who have never received justice is long and exhausting to look at as it continues to grow. In closing, I hope you all finally see America through the lens that I and countless other black people see the country through. I hope you take my talk as an attempt to educate you on the shadow that America casts as she tries to look away and deny it. I would like to end with a quote from the great Malcolm X. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound made by the blow and they haven't even pulled the knife out, much less heal the wound. They won't even admit the knife is there. I chose this quote to implore you all to be honest with yourselves. Healing can only begin with the admittance of guilt and the acceptance of responsibility. And until Amer America admits her guilt and accepts responsibility for its treatment and exploitation of black lives, then healing can never happen. I hope you all have a good rest of your day and remember, no justice, no peace. Thank you.
Good morning, Wabash. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Maddox Lee. Um, I'd like to thank the Sphinx Club and uh, Kenny and Jackson for letting me speak today. Um, when I was first asked to do this chapel talk, I was a little bit resistant. Uh, this is because I didn't know if it was my space to talk about an issue this big in America right now. As you can probably tell, I'm not part of any minority group. I'm a straight, white, Christian man living in America. Even with this, I can still see the oppressions that my fellow brothers go through. One incident that stuck with me was Trayvon Martin back in 2012. Watching the news about how a 17-year-old boy getting killed because he walked home from a convenience store really stuck with me. It made me think and made me wonder if it could happen to any of my friends because of the darker complexion of their skin. Throughout the years, I kept seeing more and more of these wrongful deaths, and my eyes kept opening wider and wider. And it made me realize what some people in this country really stood for. When I came here, I did not really have a good idea of what the Malcolm X Institute really, really was. But I went out on a limb, and I decided to join. This would be one of the best decisions I would make at Wabash. Through being in the MXI, I've been able to learn so much more about the oppressions that my brothers face while making more friends and more brothers along the way. One of the biggest things I was able to learn was that you can't just be not racist. You have to be anti-racist. If you stand by while racism is being observed, you are still a part of the problem. Another huge thing that I was able to obtain is that the MXI is for everybody. No matter what race, orientation, or position you have throughout the college. I would love to see more and more people come to the MXI and become brothers as my time here continues. Also, being white, I did not think that there was much to do to help with the movement of equality. So I stayed in the background for about my first year here. What I didn't realize was what I could r actually do to help. So I started reading. I started reading articles on anything that happened that reached national news. I also started, I also started taking action. Back home in Grand Rapids when we were all in quarantine, I went to multiple protests that were happening in the city. There are also so many petitions online that people can sign, no matter who you are. Along with this, you can also easily email political officials, such as the movements to Minnesota and Louisville. One thing that I've been able to see constantly is people online calling out racists for who they really are and showing their true colors. But one of the biggest things that you could do right now, especially this year, is to vote in the election coming up in November 3rd. <laughs> Obviously, voting is always important, but this year, it took an exponential increase. So people of Wabash, I advise you to take action for your friends, your teammates, your classmates, and brothers, and to change your perspective, have those hard talks that you don't feel comfortable bringing up, because if you don't, the world will never change for the better, and equality will never be obtained. Thank you, be safe, and wear your masks.
Before I start, I would like to give a special thanks to the Sphinx Club again, and then my brothers of the Malcolm X Institute of Black Studies in here in our support today. I stand here today hoping to lead us towards self-reflection and trying to understand justice. This semester, I focus a lot on prominent black leaders like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., James Baldwin, and others, and it seems to me that the biggest common denominator among these men has been their commitment to humanism. The way I understand humanism is as a philosophical ideology <clears throat> that emphasizes the importance of innate human goodness that is used to solve issues that face humanity while also supporting human needs. As I constantly watch our society deal with injustice, I ask myself, what does justice really mean? I have been conditioned to understand a very specific definition of justice. I have been taught to believe that individuals who do not abide by the laws of our society have to pay for their crimes, whether in time, money, and or labor. That's justice, right? But then I think of slavery and how for over 400 years, black bodies were dehumanized, disregarded, and discarded in American society, and this was considered justice. That justice was evil, and it was a part of the laws of American society. Even after the 13th Amendment assumed to abolish slavery in 1865, America itself did not pay for those crimes, for the pure injustice against black people. In fact, slavery took a, 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 took a quick breather. It went home, it showered, returned out into the world in the form of black codes. More laws, more, more state-sanctioned justice meant to dehumanize, disregard, and discard black bodies in America. Then when some people pushed back on this new fit, this new look, slavery simply went back to the lab, made some accessory changes, then came back out into the world in the form of Jim Crow. Now my goal isn't to give a history lesson today. I say this to show how laws and justice dictated how African American lives really function in America as less than human beings. Even today, though African Americans and other minorities have gained more rights, injustice still exists. I think about mass incarceration, a system that intentionally criminalizes African Americans, especially men, and places them in inhumane prisons for unjust sentences that usually do not reflect the kind of crimes they were charged for. Not to mention the number of states and businesses that legally profit off the incarceration of black bodies and the exploitation of, black la of prison labor. Now to me, this sounds like a similar legal form of uh, cruelty operating in America today, as history tends to repeat itself. My point is that injustice against human rights is thriving in America right now and has been, has been for some time. Before I was a Wabash man, before I was a man of God, before I was a black man, I was, I am, human. As human and as an American, I have a right to certain freedoms and privileges. In fact, I have a right to the same rights and privileges that I see my white counterparts having. I too have the right to judge, critique, and protest against American laws that I see as unjust and institutions that impede me from exercising these rights that I deserve. I have heard the negative comments made about current movements like Black Lives Matter. I am aware of the negative comments made about people who riot, slander, and disrespect the police, and who loot buildings predominantly owned by white corporate America in their own communities. Those who praise, support, and celebrate American values the absolute most are the same ones who often encounter America's racism and oppression the least. I have listened to the opponents of protests and point to protests as av evidence that America's crimes against black people are justified, and thus suggesting that America and American justice is operating how it's supposed to. The protests, the looting, the rioting are all cries for help and justice in this continual cycle of oppression. What I cannot reconcile, however, is that when human rights of certain Americans are constantly and consistently restricted, how anyone can be proud to be an American how anyone can stand for the national anthem while black American bodies continue to be dehumanized, disregarded, and discarded. How can anyone even want to fight for a country that continuously fails to acknowledge that they or their American brothers or sisters exist? I wonder how anyone can judge and demonize people who are brave enough to protest, riot, fight, and simply tell America, I exist too. In conclusion, I also would like to share two things Malcolm X said before his time was abruptly cut short. I first heard his 1964 speech, The Ballad of the Bullet, here my freshman year, and what struck me then still resonates with me, with me today. It's liberty or it's death, Malcolm began. It's freedom for everybody or freedom for nobody. Malcolm, or today I believe, as Malcolm did 56 years ago, that freedom has failed to properly operate in this very place we call the land of the free. This failure is due to the lack of true humanist justice that point is clear and must be clear for all of us for any progress to be made in the future. 
After his trip to Mecca in spring of 1964, Malcolm said another thing that sticks. We, as human beings, he explained, have the obligation, the responsibility of helping correct America's human problem. In other words, it is our moral duty to fight for justice for both ourselves and anyone who lacks it. It is our moral duty as humans to recognize that justice has not existed in America for a certain sector of Americans for over 400 years, and it is just as much as our duty to do something about it. Thank you. Before I begin, I would like to thank Andrew, Micah, and Maddox for being willing to speak today. As members of the MXI, we appreciate this opportunity to not only speak to our peers, but to represent our great organization. Secondly, thank you to the Sphinx Club um, for giving us the opportunity, or giving us this opportunity for allowing us, and for allowing us to have the platform to not only speak our minds, um, but to share our feelings with the student body. I believe that's what I enjoy most about this campus the freedom to speak how I feel, and more times than not, I won't be judged for doing that. But what is there about this campus, about this school, about the people here that give me and others like me a reason to feel like we must ad address the issue of race, inequality, and justice in front of such a large audience? The answer to this question is silence. The great thing about Wabash is that it gives you a space to comfortably speak your mind but this is sometimes accompanied by nothing but silence. Silence. Silence symbolizes one of two things. One, that a person is overwhelmed by the information that has been given to them, and they don't know what to do or to say. And two, silence is what comes a result, uh, silence is what comes as a result of someone being targeted by what has been said, and therefore, um, they feel confronted and are then left speechless. But wait, silence also is the response when someone just doesn't care about what has been said simply because it doesn't affect them, or so they may think. To be quite honest, I really hate silence. In a moment of awkward silence, my mind try begins trying to work through how another person may be processing the situation. Thoughts on top of thoughts on top of thoughts continue to swirl around my mind like water being flushed down the toilet. I try to formulate reasons, excuses rather, for why someone may choose to be silent. And up until seven months ago, I refused to stop and think, maybe they just don't care. Maybe I refuse to accept this possibility because of my innate tendency to associate my problems with someone else. I, I tend to think that just because it matters to me, it should, matter, it should also matter to this guy or to that girl. But I realize that this isn't just unrealistic, it is unreasonable. However, I am forced to think of the silence that was forced upon my people for hundreds of years. This was not silence that symbolized that my people didn't care, that they had no response, or that they were unsure of what to say. This silence was the result of fear. Fear that came from treatment by a group of people who supposedly believed that all men are created equal. A people that prides itself on picking themselves up by the bootstraps and fighting for their dignity independence, and freedom. A people that chose to deem slavery unconstitutional yet continue to keep my people in a position of inferiority, creating a system of racism that is still intact to this day. A people who, instead of speaking out about a system that harms their friends, teammates, sisters, brothers, uncles, aunts, mothers, whatever it may be, instead of speaking out about this system that cripples people of color, they zip their mouth shut and pretend like the zipper's broken. And so we find ourselves sitting here at Wabash College, talking about justice and the hypocrisy of how America believes justice should be carried out. We, as African Americans, have tirelessly tried to recycle a conversation that the majority white wants to identify as waste. And still, we are met with silence. And so I've just concluded that y'all just don't give a damn, quite frankly. <laughs> I say this with true frustration because you don't know how it feels to speak out about these issues in more than one way. Perform demonstrations, write in a school paper, host events. 
and still feel like the people who need to hear it the most consider themselves not a part of the problem. But I digress. I applaud President Feller, the faculty, and most of the deans that have taken a stand against racial inequality and systemic racism on this campus as well as in the world. But as a student, I am disappointed because stagnation is all that has occurred since the beginning of the school year. Similar to what Maddox says, we have to be willing to have those uncomfortable conversations and come face to face with this issue once and for all. I get tired of hearing the same thing over and over again. What can I do to help? The answer is simply anything. To help out, you can just do something. Any measure of action is better than doing nothing, better than remaining silent. As a person on this side of the color line, I shouldn't have to give you a how-to manual on how to be anti-racist. That's what the internet's for. That's what technology is for. That's what technology is for. This amazing creation that allows us to search for whatever we want and find it within seconds. Take advantage of the resources you have and go find ways to get involved. Continually asking someone what to do doesn't show that you want to help. It just shows that you're lazy and don't want to do the work by going out and taking initiative. And so I find myself at a crossroads. At this crossroads, I find my way out through some bold words that a professor spoke while on a call, Zoom call with the MXI. These words were simply, all white people are racist until proven otherwise. Hmm. How about that? And so I adopted this way of thinking, and in many ways it's problematic, but it's how I've been able to manage to get through the clouds of frustration. No one cares about my problems. No one is, is as invested in change as much as I am, unless it's people who have shown that they are willing to make sacrifices and get, in, get uncomfortable if it means making life better, making life easier for people who may look like me, or Yasin Kudos, Jonathan Silver, or Kwaku Sarpong. At the end of the day, it's just us, and when the casket finally closes, that's all it will be. Me, myself, and some dirt. But it doesn't have to be this way. I promise you it doesn't. I promise you it doesn't. As the group that makes up the majority population in this country, white people have the power to change things in this country. It's whether or not you're willing to step forward and finally say enough is enough. And whether you agree with what I've been saying or not, your responsibility is to do what's morally right period. I deserve the right to be able to drive down the street or walk out my door and not worry about whether or not this will be my last day. My younger brothers and my, young, my little sister deserve that right. My mom deserves the peace of mind If y'all know me, y'all know I don't cry. <laughs> My mom deserves the peace of mind knowing that she can trust placing her children in the world and that they will be okay. And I know that some of you feel as though we deserve that, right? But what's stopping you from acting on this? The answer is simple, silence. As I leave you today, I challenge you to do one thing. Speak up, that's it. To conclude, I just have one question. What will it take to get you invested in this issue and to end the silence once and for all? Thank you. Just one quick announcement, punt, pass, and kick will be this Saturday at 11 a.m. Um, it'll be the first event ever on the Wabash College football field, so we hope to see everybody out there. Uh, now can we sing Old Wabash? Da -da 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 -da.